record just to get ready. All right, I'm going to start the webinar. Here we go. All righty. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon if you're East Coast and good morning if you're West Coast, <laughs> like I am. My name is Lauren Post, and I am the non-chapter city chair for Israel Policy Forum, ATID. IPF ATID is the Young Professional Network of Israel Policy Forum, uh, an organization dedicated to the secure Jewish and democratic state of Israel. We're super excited to welcome you to the next installment of our Voices from the Grassroots series. Um, this is an initiative aimed at highlighting the grass work, grassroots work being done to support democracy and is in Israel at this very critical moment. Um, we are so grateful to be joined today by Shams Frej and Mohamed Zawabi. So really briefly to introduce our incredible panelists, firstly Shams. Um, she's a 23-year-old fourth-year civil engineering student at the Technion Institute of Technology in Haifa. Shams is very proud of her father as a former minister of regional cooperation in the last Israeli government and a former Knesset member. She shares his belief in creating a peaceful nation for Palestinians like herself alongside the Jewish community. She's from a small town outside of Tel Aviv and grew up with five sisters and a brother. She is an active alumna of Tomorrow's Women, an NGO empowering young Israeli and Palestinian women to create change in areas of conflict. And Muhammad Zawabi, he is a 25-year-old Arab citizen of Israel. He was born in Nazareth to an Arab-Palestinian Israeli Muslim family and grew up in Nof Hagalil, a Jewish suburb where he finished high school. After graduating high school, Muhammad started a pre-army college at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Later in the 20, summer of 2017, he worked as a Jewish agency delegate at a summer camp in Crane Lake, Massachusetts, classic. <laughs> a few months later, he started his army service at the IDF spokesman unit in Tel Aviv, where he has lived since. Today, Muhammad studies uh, government and sustainability at Reichman University in Herzliya. He's a freelance speaker, writer, and works at a local Tel Aviv Ethiopian restaurant that focuses on educating about the Beta Israel community. In addition, Muhammad is a social, social media activist who promotes the rights and visibility of the Israeli LGBT community with a focus on Arab society. He also addresses the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Arab-Jewish relations in Israel, alongside a myriad of other topics. So both of you, thank you so much um, for coming and speaking about this very important topic. Um, before we start, for everyone in the audience, um, we want to encourage questions, uh, but please send any questions to the chat. We'll also send reminders in the chat. We will um, have dedicated time for Q&A towards the end of our session. Also, please, just a gentle, gentle reminder, the session is um, off the record. So please don't be a jerk about that. Okay, are you guys ready for some questions? Because I have some things to ask you. <laughs> okay, to start, um, could each of you tell me and the audience a little bit about yourselves? How did you get involved in the activism that you currently are engaging in? And these are for whomever feels inspired to take a first stab at it. Um, I'm happy to start. So as you said earlier, Lauren, thank you for this amazing introduction. Uh, so as you said, my father was uh, the Minister of Regional Cooperation in the last Israeli government. So he knew that in order to change our reality as Arabs in Israel, he, uh, we need to be part of the political game. So he took a brave decision, decision that affected our lives to make an impact. So he made a voice that a lot of Arabs believe in, but they didn't say it out loud. For that, I am very proud of him. And he was the he was the reason I joined Tomorrow's Women Organization in the first place. And since then, I, I think I am involved more in this activism, trying to kind of follow my father's footsteps and make a bit of, bit of a change, you know? For sure, I love that. Um, your 
I heard you speak um, a month ago or so on a panel and was like, my God, if there is reason to have hope for the conflict, it's people like you. And it's not often I feel super hopeful about things regarding the conflict, but you gave me that. So, you know, thank you. That's dope. Um, thank you. Yeah. Muhammad, is there anything you want to add or say or? Uh, well, hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and uh, Shams, it's an honor to be with you in the same panel. Uh, your father is definitely uh, uh, an example to a lot of uh, Arab citizens uh, in Israel. Um, I think that uh, one of the main reasons why I decided to uh, put myself out there is, is the sense of duality that I've always experienced. Um, you know, growing up uh, in, an, in, a, in a family that has been uh, very much divided on, on uh, has been divided on, on many different levels, uh, on the national level, on the uh, religious slash secular level, on the cultural level. I have a lot of families who self-identify more as Palestinians, others who self-identify more as Israeli. I have, uh, you know, certain people who see themselves as more secularists, others who see themselves as more religious. Um, you know, even the usage of the language, Hebrew, Arabic, or, or you know, the cultural sort of uh, um, integration, it was always, it was always this sense of, uh, uh, of duality. And I think it's a unique uh, collective experience that is unique to the uh, 2 million Arab citizens of Israel. Uh, that's always sort of pushed to the sides, uh, especially in the wider context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, and I think that that was the main reason why uh, I decided to, or I decide every day uh, to keep myself out there and, and talk about these things. That's incredible. Mohammed, I don't know if you remember, but we used to work together at Stand With Us many, many- well, I, thought, I remembered your face and I'm like, where do I, Lauren, I, like, I know her from somewhere. And I'm like, where do I know her from? Yeah, oh, so I saw that and I rem I always remember the work that you did being so incredibly thoughtful and nuanced and just like smart. And I always appreciated that. So I saw your name on this and was like, oh yeah, this is going to be great. But it's good to see you. Um, mm -hmm. Just wanted to be, bounce that and put that out there for our own uh, amusement. <laughs> um, so for the next question, um, this is about the Arab community in the pro-democracy protest movement. So to what extent has this community been involved and what factors have contributed to the community's general willingness or lack thereof to participate? And are there certain sectors that are more prone to it? Can you tell us like a little bit more about that for either of you? Shams, you want to go ahead? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> um, so I think that um, <clears throat> there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of topics that can be talked about in the, in the context of, of the Arab community and the current protest movement. Um, I've been protesting since well, the, the early days, uh, but I know that I'm not part of a mass of Arab citizens who are participating. And I think that there are uh, many reasons to that. One of the main reasons is the fact that uh, there are a lot of, you know, generally good uh, citizens, pro-democracy citizens who really care about this country, who care about the morals and the values of this country, who seem to not understand the way we see things. And the way the Arab community in Israel sees things is that we draw a straight line. And that straight line goes from the occupation to discrimination towards Arabs, to the current judicial coup and the, the crazy, you know, um, a, a constitutional mess that we're seeing um, and the uh, the far right government that we got, uh, which in my opinion, by the way, was a reactionary government to the former government, which uh, which was a, a, a diverse government in, in, in a way that we've never seen in Israel. And so I think that the fact that uh, a lot of people or a lot of uh, uh, or many of the main organizers of the protest movement uh, do not uh, at least publicly acknowledge that connection or that straight line um, it deters a lot of Arab citizens or it deters the masses from the Arab community from, from actively participating. But I can tell you for sure that the, the majority of the Arab citizens in Israel are aware of what's happening. They're following what's happening. They know that we'll be the first targets uh, of, of any uh, attack on the autonomy of our judiciary. And also we know that our judiciary has never or not always has it been you know, defensive of, of the Arab community or for example, Palestinians um, living under occupation in the West Bank or in East Jerusalem. But we at the same time know that with the lack of clear separation of powers in Israel, uh, the lack of constitution that guarantees equality, and the fact that we don't even have the word equality in their set of laws, um, we know that our, the judiciary is the last uh, frontier that protects us or has the ability uh, to protect us from draconian uh, governments. 
yeah, I think that's, there's a lot to like unpack there. And I feel like that's a good place to start unpacking a lot of that. Uh, Shams, do you have anything to add or continue to unpacking um, this case a little bit? Well, I can't tell you what's the percent, what's the exact percent of Arabs that took part in the pro-democracy protest movement, but, and they don't know big Arab movements that said that they are against what's happening in Israel. I guess that, that a lot of movements aren't active because of political beliefs, and also others may not see the protest as directly, directly relevant to their own daily struggles. And, and some may choose to focus their energy on something else, some other forms of activism. But the government, I think the government is a big issue and it, it affects us all. I know that, but, I, but not a lot of people do. I, and I am sure that there are a lot of Arabs that go to pro-democracy pro protest individually, but as a movement, I, I didn't hear of any. Yeah, I can see how like this government is like complicated, compounded with like years of mistrust and abuse and all that can contribute to a lot of just malaise and milk toast feelings about a democracy movement in general. Um, and kind of going off of that and like the how the past impacts like a democracy oriented future, um, the issue of violence and crime um, has been in the, in the Arab community has been a prime focus. It's been a talking point of both the current and previous governments. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about successful, uh, what successes or failures there's been to their approaches in dealing with this particular issue? Why is it such a focus of policymaking? Um, and what do you think are the factors that contribute to the increase in crime uh, and the violence? And what are other major issues, in your opinion, that are currently impacting um, your communities uh, right now? Um. Sadly, nowadays, we can say that any government succeeded 100%. Also, because of the, gov of the government, they keep on changing rapidly. They, they don't have a long-term effect. We need a stable government, a stable action, a plan to um, fight this violence. And we can see a proof of that. Nothing was successful. Just yesterday, a 19-year-old girl was killed, was murdered. I think it's a result of neglect. All of this violence, more needs to be done to address the causes of the problem. The country situation is very scary for me. I, for us, Arabs here think of every little move they make in order for the other side to not think of them as terrorists. At least that's what I think. Because today, whenever they think that someone is a terrorist or even a thought of that, they'll hurt them or maybe kill them. They don't investigate first, they kill them on the spot, unfortunately. It's really scary because they can suspect anyone. Arabs living in Israel face violence from both sides, my opinion. Um, so I think that if we talk about the uh, the organized crime that we see in, uh, uh, in in Arab communities, I think there's a lot of things to sort of unpack here. The the one of the main things that we should remember and keep in mind is that until the early 2000s, Arabs made up less than five percent of the total murder in the country. But since the early 2000s, we've we've seen a, a continuous uh, uh, increase in the percentage. Uh, of, of the Arabs who were murdered until we got to the point that we are today, uh, in which Arabs make up of, of around 80% of the total murders. A community of 20% makes up of 80% uh, of the total murders. And I think that there are two main reasons to that. Uh, the main reason is the social, the changes, the deep changes of the social structure of the Arab community, uh, uh, in particular in Israel. Um, up until the 90s, uh, the family, the sort of core family social structure was very strong, meaning that uh, it was more patriarchal. Uh, there was, you know, there's, there were figures, uh, usually men, who were very uh, dominant, very influential, whether it be leaders of, of, of small communities or fathers or uncles, um, you know, men with influence on people. And since the early 2000s, we've, we've seen a change in that because the traditional structure of the Arab family 
has completely changed. Uh, there's a growing uh, middle class in the Arab community. Uh, women have uh, started to acquire more and more education. Um, we see also that there are a lot of young Arabs um, who are, by the way, very unemployed. A lot of them, at least a uh, 35% of them are unemployed. Um, and in addition to that, to the social, the social changes, uh, there's an absence of the state, as has always been. Uh, you know, the state, just as it treats, the, as just as, let's say, there's an absence of the state in the ultra-Orthodox community, there's an absence of the state in the Arab community. Uh, meaning that, you know, the state sort of, uh, you, know, the, you know, the state wants to eat from the cake. I don't know if I'm translating, you know, the phrase uh, accurately in English, but it also wants to keep it full. Meaning that the state wants to be a sovereign state where everybody is under the same law, at least in Israel proper, but at the same time, it's not really giving uh, equal uh, um, uh, state services, uh, the police is not uh, present enough, um, and there's an absence uh, of, of the state. And these two uh, factors combined got us to where we are today. Now, the biggest change that we've seen in the attitude from the government was really during the last uh, the, the last government, Bennett Lapid government, with uh, with uh, with Ram uh, participating in the government. Um, and you know, one of the main encouraging uh, 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 facts about the go that government is that it was the government with not only you know people tend to focus on the fact that it was the uh, the, the first government to uh, to include uh, an independent Arab party in its coalition, uh, but most people forget to talk about the coalition itself and the coalition was also uh, the first coalition with so much so many arabs i mean not not representative enough of our percentage in the population uh but representative enough especially in comparison to this current government that literally has zero uh, zero arabs zero minorities and almost zero women um and in addition to other things but i think that these two factors were very encouraging because we felt that we could pressure the government from within um and 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 you know polls uh, done in the Arab community show that the priorities of the Arab community uh, are, include you know, dealing with the, uh, with the spiking crime and also integration into the government. At least 70% of Arab citizens in Israel want to be active parts uh, part of, 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 gov of, of uh, governing coalitions. Um, and I think uh, we've seen uh, a, a, a sort of um, a change in that short period of the Bennett Lapid government. We saw, we've seen a decrease um, in uh, the uh, the uh, the number of, of, of people who were uh, murdered in general, uh, but in particular in the Arab community. And we've also sh seen a bit of a change of attitudes of the police, you know, uh, towards the Arab community. Uh, the, the chief police recently said that it's our mentality to kill each other. Uh, that's that's the leader of, of the police. And in, in my opinion, you know, when, when I hear uh, the chief police saying that, I immediately connect it to the occupation, to the culture of policing Arabs, to the culture of seeing Arabs as this, you know, uh, uh, you know crazy, uh, a relentless collective that is just violent by nature. And, and that's a result of, 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 of at least uh, 55 years of occupation, of policing Arabs. Israel cannot uh, deal with its Arab citizens uh, in, a, in a civilian way without having the occupation influence its attitude towards, uh, towards its citizen. And the other reason that's connected to the police, and that will be my last point in, in regards to that, is that, uh, uh, you know, up until maybe 10 years ago, we've seen violence erupt, uh, organized crime, you know, uh, in, in, in Jewish majority cities like Tel Aviv, Netanya, Haifa, uh, Khadera, and other places. Um, what people tend to forget is that a lot of the people who are working for these organized criminals or cr uh, uh, crime gangs were Arabs. And when these crime gangs were, were, were sort of uh, tackled uh, by the police in the Jewish majority cities, what did these people, what did these Arabs do? They went to the backyard of the state of Israel, which is Arab cities. And they know that the police there is not active. They know that nobody's going to stop them. Or if they stop them, it's going to take them forever. And they do whatever they want to do. And, and that's how we got to where we are today. Yeah, it, I don't know. There's a really funny sketch show on Hulu. It's called I Think You Should Leave with Tim Robinson. There's this iconic sketch. Um, he drives a hot dog mobile into a store. He steals a bunch of suits. And he's like, we're all just trying to find the guy who did this. And it kind of sounds like a lot like that's what the Israeli state is up to. It's just a real mystery. Um, but you uh, uh, kind of touched on the next question, I think, a little bit. And that was, how did Ra'am's participation in the last government impact attitudes? Um, and what impact did it have on Arab communities? And then I kind of also am interested in how um, have Arab voting trends evolved in recent years? It seems like there's been like significant shifts, but also like they're interesting, but maybe not as impactful as I would like to hope personally. But maybe you can shed some light on that. Either of you. 
Um, I think Iran's participation in the previous Israeli government was a historic moment for Arab society in Israel. It was the first time in decades that a full Arab party had agreed to join an Israeli government coalition. This move was uh, was amazing, was significant because it it signaled the willingness by some Arabs politicians politicians to engage in the Israeli political system and work towards positive change from within. And as part of the coalition agreement, the government pledged to allo allocate additional resources to, uh, to address the needs of Arab, Arab uh, society, such as funding for education, for healthcare. And of course, in recent years, um, I think there has been an increase in Arab voting trends in Israeli elections. I don't know if Mohammed, you have uh, another opinion on this, but I saw that it's, it was in, it was increased. Um, so I think that what will uh, regarding what Cham said uh, to the uh, the turnout in the Arab community, it's sort of ups and ups and downs. There was a, a drastic increase, for example, when uh, when Ram uh, joined the, the joined the joint list. Uh, and there were four parties that uh, uh, that uh, were together in in one political alliance, and that encouraged more and more Arabs to uh, to vote. And I think it got to like sixty five or even seventy percent, which was one of the highest. Um, but usually, I think the turnout in the Arab community still is low compared to uh, Jewish citizens. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there are many reasons for that, but I think that one of the main trends that we see, politically speaking, in the Arab community is that less and less Arabs vote for Zionist parties. Um, you know, Arab citizens have historically uh, been split uh, almost 50-50 between those who vote for uh, usually left-wing Zionist parties and Arab, uh, Arab, Arab parties. And today we see that uh, there's a shrinking number of Arabs who are voting for the Zionist parties. And the main reason to that is that, you know, as Shams said earlier, Arabs feel that the, the discourse, even of the left in Israel, or what's left of it, um, is not relevant to them. Uh, it's, it's just disconnected from their problems, from, the, from their needs, and so less and less people vote for them. But at the same time, a lot of people don't feel comfortable voting for the current Arab parties, uh, because a lot of the Arab parties are either closed clubs that are not open for everybody, or, for example, Ram which can represent a lot of citizens, but its Islamist uh, nature can deter a lot of secularists from the Arab community. Um, so there, there, there are a lot of reasons. The, the, the bottom line is that uh, we have a, a, we lack alternatives. Um, you know, we're, we're, sort of, uh, we're sort of stuck in uh, between, uh, you know, bad and worse. Um, and um, but but if we if we talk uh, about uh, uh, you know uh, Rams uh, uh, you know joining the uh, the last government. It's historic. I mean, there's no other way to put it for many, many reasons. It wasn't the first party to join an Arab uh, uh, government in Israel, but it was the first independent uh, Arab party to independently um, and democratically vote internally uh, to join uh, the uh, uh, the government. It, it, it is an Islamist party, but it is a pretty democratic party, uh, we should mention. Um, and so I think that that in itself was very, uh, uh, very historic. And I think that um, you know, there's a lot of reasons to why it's historic. I mean, who, I mean, if you would have told me like a few years ago that we were about to have a government head by Bennett, a former settlement leader, joined by Meretz and an Islamist party, and you know, a wide range of different parties from Israel Beitenu to Yesh Atid and Labor, all united under the same goal of ousting Bibi, I would laugh at you. I would think you're you're just not, you know, you're you're out of touch. But it happened, and it proves to us that everything's possible. When, when there's political uh, willingness, everything is possible. Um, that being said, unfortunately, or, you, know, you know, pointing out this optimistic note, the current government is a sort of per excellence reactionary government to the last government. Um, Israeli Jews are split almost 50-50 when it comes to their uh, willingness to even imagine Arab participation in the governance of Israel. And the last government, basically was able to motivate a lot of the right wing base in Israel to go out and vote. That's how that's why we saw a higher turnout in uh, right wing uh, uh, communities or in bases uh, across the country, especially in the settlements. And that's how we got, uh, you know, a Kahanist political bloc as our third largest uh, political bloc in parliament. I mean, they hate each other more than they hate the Arabs, probably. That's why they're not working together as one body anymore. Uh, but they did run together and they got uh, a, a big electoral uh, electoral achievement. And unfortunately,
unfortunately, it was the it was the reaction uh, to an Islamist Arab party, not even just joining the Israeli government with Bennett, Lapid, and, and other right wing people, but an Islamist party leader who literally fulfilled the dream of many Israeli Jews. You know, Israeli Jews would always tell us, why don't you have Arab leaders who recognize the nature of the state? Why don't you, you know, why don't you come towards the state and, and show the state that you want to be part of it? And here we are, we, you know, we had an Islamist right-wing Arab leader who not only recognized the Jewishness of the state, I mean, we all do, all members of parliament have to when they run for parliament because it's literally one of one of the main you know uh, things that you have to uh, swear allegiance to Israel's nature as a democratic and Jewish state. But we had that actively, an active Arab mainstream Arab leader who recognized Israel's Jewishness, and yet the Jewish reaction to it is a Kahanist government, and that says a lot about the willingness on the other side uh, to accept us as 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 equal. Uh, um, uh, participants and, and partners in ruining, uh, uh, ruining this, ruling, not ruining, ruling uh, uh, this, this country. Great, thank you so much. I feel like I will have more questions, but I need to digest that a little bit um, before I think through anything else to ask you. Um, but kind of shifting in a little bit of a direction, you've talked a lot about like the Kahanist nature of this current government and how like profoundly frustrating that is to have something that was like so promising. Things could things weren't great, but they could have been better. And then we have this particular government where it's just, it's, it was bad and now it's worse. Um, kind of thinking through that, uh, there's a lot through the Israeli center and the center left that um, will claim that if we want like the pro-democracy block to stay democracy, to preserve that block, um, that we actually need real Jewish Arab political cooperation. Um, so I'm curious, what does that look like to each of you? And have you seen any successful examples of Jewish Arab political cooperation? Um, and then if you have anything about what made it successful, um, I think that a lot of us would be really curious to hear in your opinion, what makes these kind of cooperations and relationships work? Um, well, the idea of Jewish Arab political cooperation in Israel has been a subject of debate and discussion for many years, particularly among those of on the Israeli center left who believe that such cooperation is necessary to create a more in, uh, inclu inclusive and democ democratic society. Well, uh, I can say that true Jewish Arab political cooperation would require both uh, communities to work together to address issues, like I said, of, of mutual concern and find common ground on key policy areas. Uh, and the biggest example I can give is the party my dad was in, Meretz, a party that fights for equality for both Arabs and Jews, for democracy, a party that works to bring peace for both sides, um, a party that really stands with Jewish people and with Arabs that, uh, but unfortunately not all Arabs vote to this party because they say it's a Zionist, a Zionist party. We don't vote to a Zionist party. Why should we vote? My dad is a Zionist a member. Why should we vote for him? Even if he is an Arab, you know? And unfortunate, unfortunately, this party isn't part of the government today but hopefully, hopefully the next one. He was so talented and I always like found his perspectives on like, I think he got asked quite often, like, why? You know, like, why would you engage with this government? And he was just like, it's my home. Like I have a duty to my people to like- It's his home. I think that one of, um, and I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about talking about it. I think one of the even more uh, inspiring things about uh, former minister Fridge is that uh, he's a descendant of, of, of someone who was killed in the Kvalkasem massacre, uh, which, was, uh, which was basically committed by Israeli forces in 1956 uh, when Arab citizens of Israel were living under martial law. Um, and that, that even makes it more, um, uh, more inspiring uh, to see yes, someone like exactly. him. Sorry, yeah. It's, it's my grandfather. You, you can, yeah. Think about it. It's crazy for someone to like be in the government, even if his grandfather was, was one of the victims, you know? It's, it's not even thinkable, you know? It's, 
it's crazy. It just it just made me think about it again, and I'm like, whoa, goosebumps, really. Yeah, that's like it's incredible, and I've always been a huge admirer of your dad, and now increasingly a huge fan of you. So that's awesome. That's awesome, um, Muhammad. I think feel like this is a topic you probably have some thoughts and feelings about. I see your Instagram stories. You're like out on the streets, and uh, yeah. Curious what your thoughts do you mind, are. Do you mind just repeating the general idea of the question? I just got so uh, <laughs> emotional by what we just. <laughs> no worries. Um, kind of curious about what center left, the center left will argue. We need a pro democracy block. Hmm. Pro democracy needs Jewish Arab cooperation. What does that look like? And what are some successful examples of that? Plus, why do you think they work? Right. Well, I think that. Um... I think that one of the main things that the last government proved to us is that A, um, the center left will never come back to power without uh, at least one Arab party, at least partnership with at least one Arab party. Um, and in addition to that, uh, you know, encouraging Arab citizens to vote in higher numbers. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, these sort of two conclusions um, make us all understand, especially, I mean, I prefer the term liberal, by the way, because I think uh, the definition right and, and left in Israel is very, um, it's very unclear. Um, I mean, I'm a leftist in Israeli terms, but I'm not sure if I'm a socialist. Uh, I think I'm more into a free market, uh, for example. That's just one example, um, because left and right in Israel is more of sort of oriented towards your opinion on the occupation, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it's just really, it feels to me that it's just not relevant that much um, to the traditional definition of that. So therefore, I prefer the term uh, liberals uh, as opposed to conservatives, uh, because that's, I would feel that that's the more accurate way to put it. And I think that uh, the liberal majority camp in Israel, um, aka the center left, um, is, uh, you know, started to realize this. Um, and I think that uh, we did with the last government, we did get to a point where um, where we understood that there's no way to um, to actually oust Benjamin Netanyahu or to even uh, you know offer an alternative to his path uh, without partnership with uh, uh, with with Arab parties. Uh, the the more frustrating things though about this specific uh, thing is that we had members of the last government that would have not been created without uh, the Arab votes that in the previous round of elections, when Benny Gantz had a clearer majority, like 63 or 62, if I'm not mistaken, and would have been able to form a government um, with, uh, uh, with Arab parties, they basically refused. And because of them, uh, we had to go to a third and a fourth uh, and eventually a fifth uh, round of elections. So I think that a lot of Israeli Jews, especially Israeli Jewish politicians, need to, need to really liberate themselves from the stigma of working with our political representation. Listen, I have a lot of things to say about our political representation, but it's our political representation, period. Uh, nobody gets to determine to us who our political representation are. Do I like Hadash? Absolutely not 100%. I agree with some of what they say or what they do. Do they represent me 100%? Absolutely not. Do I like the Islamist party of Ram? Absolutely not. Do I like Balad? Absolutely. You know what I mean? So, so it's not really, it, that's not the point. The point is that Arab voters decided who they want to vote it for, who want to vote for, and they voted for who they voted for. And when we delegitimize our political representation, we delegitimize the community. Therefore, we are contributors to the current government and to governments like this, to Kahanism, to extremism, to racism, to pushing Arabs to the side. We can't give an alternative to the other side if we repeat the same rhetoric or if we uh, submit to the, uh, the conversation that they want to impose um, on us. One of the things that I appreciate about the leader of Hadash, Ayman Udi, is that um, before the joint list collapsed, uh, the main reason to the, uh, to the collapse of, 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 the, of the joint list was divisions over uh, queer issues in the Arab community. Uh, the LGBTQ community in, within the Arab community has been uh, the topic of debate uh, in the last years. And the peak of that, or one of the peaks of that was uh, when um, actually the leader of Meretz um, uh, at the time, uh, Nitan Horowitz, former minister of, of health, uh, proposed uh, to, um, to ban conversion therapy. And Ram, uh, which was still at the time part of the joint list, wanted to basically impose its conservative Islamist opinion uh, on the rest of, uh, of the parties, the three secular parties, which is Hadash, uh, uh, Tal, and Balad. 
And Ayman Udi stood firm and said, no, we're not, we're not going to submit to, to this attempt to impose your uh, religious opinion on us. And we're going to vote for uh, banning conversion therapy. Unfortunately, since then, we haven't heard them uh, talk uh, about uh, the rights of the uh, LGBT community in the, Arab, in the Arab community. But still, that is something that I, uh, that I think is worth, is worth mentioning. And I think it's worth mentioning, not just because I want to compliment Ayman Udi, but because it's interesting that the majority of people don't know that the main reason why the largest political project in the Arab community in Israel collapsed was the Arab LGBTQ community. Um, and, and a lot of people miss that. A lot of people think, oh, it was because of BB and because Ram wanted to join BB. No, no, no. no. The main reason was the queer Arab community and divisions over uh, the queer Arab community and the pressure that members of the Arab civil society in Israel put on the leaders of the joint list not to comply with the Islamist approach of Ram. So I think that was worth mentioning. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, I kind of want to untangle a little further. You talked about like, oh, I don't like this party. I don't like these things kind of like bug me. Can you like say a little more um, about like why some approaches within like the Arab parties do you find like frustrating and the other ones that are like, you're like, oh yeah, like I can get on. You talked about like a lot about what you can get on board with like I'm an all day. Right. What like is the stuff that you find challenging? Well, the, the first thing that I find challenging is sectarianism. I'm not a sectarian person. I don't believe in sectarianism. We have a neighbor up to the north that has been uh, ruled by sectarianism, sectarianism, and we've seen where it got to. It's it's collapsing completely from within. I'm talking about Lebanon. I don't want Israel to get to that place. And I think that as time what goes mean? by- It's so great. Uh, Lebanon is you know, paradise. <laughs> right? Like, um, it's it's actually sad. You know, Lebanon had such potential and it still has potential. And I really hope for the best for, 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 for Lebanon, but 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 it's just an example of, of what sectarianism could, could get us to. So that's the main reason. I, I don't I don't think that I need, I don't think that uh, I, I can only be represented by Arabs. Absolutely not. I can be represented by anybody who shares my values, who share my, uh, uh, you know, my aspirations for the future, who shares my, uh, my, you know, my pain, my, uh, my needs, etc. Um, and therefore, I am more, uh, more of a sort of, I, I mean, I don't even like the term Jewish Arab, to be honest, Jewish Arab partnership, I just would want to vote as an Israeli citizen to an Israeli party that cares about Israeli citizens. You know, all these all these talks about not that I'm saying that we should ignore our unique collective identities or push them to the side. No, absolutely not. But I think that it's about time that in addition to our, uh, let's say, unique collective uh, um, um, identities uh, as Jewish identity and Arab identity or Palestinian identity or Israeli Jewish identity, whatever you want to call it, unicorn identity, everybody in their terminology. I think it's about time that we create another level of identity, and that is our shared uh, um, uh, nationality, our shared citizenship. Um, and I think that that should be the motivation for our political uh, for our pol political leadership uh, to care for the entire citizens of, of the country and to uh, to to just leave behind that culture of sectarianism. Uh, so these are these I would say that these are the, the two main reasons why um, I generally don't uh, uh, don't I don't vote for Arab parties. Let, let's put it this way. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, we can talk about the ideological differences. Obviously, I'm, I'm queer, I'm, I'm secular, I'm not going to vote for, for, for Ram, although I agree with its uh, political approach, its pragmatism when it comes to its willingness to, uh, to compromise and to, to join governments, etc. Um, so, you know, it's a, we can talk about it till tomorrow, as we say. Yes, <laughs> it's a long topic. yes. I love that. Shams, do you have anything that you want to add? I'm like very curious as like a young woman growing up in this space um, with some like concerns around violence in the community and just kind of growing up like if the parties kind of you should kind of have some of the same issues or like what are your challenges and where do you think there's opportunities for like political representation specifically? Um, of course, it wasn't it wasn't easy growing up in a left wing uh house you know not it's not very acceptable in the arab society that you are you vote for for a jewish party even even though they have arab members they don't arabs don't really care if they have two or three arab members in the in this party if they are in a if they if they share the same uh interest and if they share the same party with Jewish people, it's like, it's a problem, you know? I'm doing something wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm voting for a Zionist party. I'm doing something that, that isn't 
that is, isn't the same as my uh, friends or, or a neighbors and everything. But uh, like I said, my, I, my dad was in Meritz for like more than 30 years from the 90s. He's like an OG kind of kind of member then. That's incredible. <laughs> he he was in merits first he wasn't but like when he went to the university and like he started meeting new friends they he learned what merits is, you know. He learned everything about it. And since then he said that's where I belong and nobody's going to change that. Nobody's going to tell me what to do or for whom to vote, you know. Um I don't, I, I don't get uh, scared or something that I'm voting for merits. I don't really care what people think. Me and my whole family, my whole five sisters, all of us vote merits. We, we love merits. It's like, it's also our home. Even though my dad wasn't in the, wasn't running for the last government, I, I voted merits because, because it's, it's 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 me you know it's like where we grew up to where we grew up at you know is that does that answer your question or I got I really so. emotional right now, right now sorry no I I feel like this is the topic of like where you kind of politically identify it gets really it touches to the heart of like a lot of personal identity stuff so I completely enjoy and like appreciate that you like feel like you can be emotional here um thank you I for just, sharing that I really feel connected you know but a lot of Arabs don't understand that they don't but when like my friends when they meet my father and knows what he believes in and why he chose a merits at the first place they really get to uh, understand the reason why and they flip you know just people don't understand. They need to, they need to enter your Zoom more often. <laughs> well, we're happy to just do the bridge building and offer the space. Um, you bring the folks and we'll provide the space. So that sounds fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, so kind of like the last question that I had prepared for you all, or you both rather. Um, I think it would be remiss to have this event and not note that it's Nakba Day. Um, it's a day of commemoration of uh, Palestinian catastrophe um, associated with the establishment of Israel. And I'm curious how like, you personally relate to the day. Um, how does your community uh, relate to today? Um, and how could Israeli society do better to reconcile um, the very stark differences in how both Israelis and Palestinians or Israeli Arabs Palestinian Arabs um, understand the day. Well, you had to you had to ask us this question. Why? Um, I think it's a very very complicated uh, situation. From one hand, it's a it's a very happy day for the Israelis, and on the other hand, it's a very sad day for the Palestinians. I think that in this day, the Israelis should understand the Palestinians, why it's, it, it's hurts and why it's a hard day for, for them. You know, the term Nakba means catastrophe in Arabic. So, so for, for that, I think it should be a day full of um, recognizing the pain and suffering experienced by Palestinians during the events of 1948. Um, and at the end of the day, it's a... It's 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 just a hard day for Arabs and a happy day for Israelis. You know? Yeah, I feel like those are two such extreme emotions. They can be like felt so extremely. It can be really hard to to reconcile. And um, yeah, that's not. Yeah, I'm curious also, how Mohammed, you might feel about it or how you feel like Israel could do better reconciling um, the two um, two days. Well, I mean, I think that. Uh... Uh, you know, you, you asked how Israelis can do better in understanding. I think that we need to, to sort of try to diffuse uh, the um, the negative connotation with the Nakba because the Nakba, as Sham said, means catastrophe. And that catastrophe describes basically the destruction of the Arabic speaking majority society that existed in this land between the river and the sea for at least a thousand years. Um, later on, the Nakba became the, the main event uh, for Palestinian nationalism. It's the main event in the collective history of the Palestinian people. That being said, collectively speaking, the Arab slash Palestinian Israeli community 
um, developed a, a sort of con unique collective identity and experience within Israel that combines sort of both elements of, of Jewish Israeli uh, nationalism and Arab Palestinian nationalism. Um, but at the end of the day, Nakba to uh, to uh, to Arabs and to uh, uh, Palestinians uh, means the destruction of 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 their society that existed here. A lot of people connected to. Um, to uh, uh, the culture of, I would call it, appropriation of the Nakba for political purposes to delegitimize uh, the very um, uh, right of Israel to exist. Uh, and therefore, a lot of Israelis might have negative connotation with the Nakba, or a lot of Israelis connect the Nakba uh, always automatically to the war that happened between Israel and its Arab neighbors, or more accurately, we should say, between the neighboring Arab dictators that had their own uh, aspirations uh, here. Not that they cared about the Palestinians that much. They just wanted to wipe out any uh, possibility of uh, creation of Israel to not create a Palestinian state, but to extend their own territory. You know, this can be said about the leaders of Egypt at the time, the leaders of Jordan, the leaders, the leaders of Syria, the only Arab neighboring country that didn't have any aspiration to extend its borders into, uh, into, into our land, Israel slash Palestine was actually Lebanon. Um, it was even forced to participate in, in, the, in the war back then. Um, and so I think that we need to diffuse a lot of, um, a lot of misconceptions, a lot of, um, um, a lot of uh, triggering uh, uh, things that, uh, that a lot of Israelis sort of connected to, uh, uh, to the Nakba. And, and, and we, need to, we need to reconcile. We need to recognize each other's uh, collective trauma, a collective story. Um, the Nakba is actually, uh, uh, I would, I would personally argue, I think Shams might disagree with me, but I think that I would personally argue uh, it is the only uh, big event in our history that is coming to us or shared by us and by the Palestinians. Because Israeli, the Arab community in, in, in Israel proper is not only distinct from the Jewish Israeli society, we're also distinct in our collective experience and identity from, uh, from the Palestinian population in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and in the rest of the world, because we are citizens of Israel. And so, you know, it's a very complicated day. Independence Day, Yom Ha'atzmaut is a complicated day, and also Nakba Day is a complicated day. The, uh, the, the only or the, 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 the most helpful thing to me, by the way, is the fact that usually because of the Hebrew calendar, Yom Ha'atzmaut falls on April. And Yom Nakba is always on May 15th. So I'm personally able to distinct, you know, to the sort of separate between the two. I mean, Israel was founded on May 15th, but um, uh, you know, but but usually uh, Yom Ha'atzmaut is celebrated uh, celebrated on, on on April. So I think, I mean, I, you know, I'm at peace with the complexity and duality of my identity, and I think that a lot of us are. Um, and I think that uh, in order for us to actually reconcile and to actually um, help. Um, you know, it's going to sound like a cliche, but it's really not. Uh, to help peace prevail, uh, we need to be able to recognize each other's collective trauma, collective story, and therefore identity, because literally our identity is a result of our collective story and trauma. And without recognizing all these three together, we can't really talk about, uh, you know, uh, justice and, and, and peace um, in this place. Yeah, phenomenal. I feel like this is like, yeah, I think you both have really touched on how complicated um, today is and also like the duality. I feel like that's something that you both have talked about a lot today is like the duality and like having to hold many things in both hands and that is what that is. And we're, that's we're a unique growth. creature. I mean, we're, we're a result of, of a national conflict, but we're also a result of the creation of the state of Israel. I can't see, you know, a lot of people say, oh, when you talk about Nakba, you're talking about the very existence of Israel being a catastrophe. Absolutely not, not for me and not for a lot of Arabs and a lot of Palestinians, I would even argue. Um, and I think that, you know, that should be recognized and that should be put also on the table. You know, the, the creation of Israel, I, I might have a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, things to say about the foundations of the country or what it did during its foundation, the atrocities that it committed or the mass expulsion of Arabs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can talk, you know, until tomorrow, as I said, but I don't see the very existence of the country as a catastrophe. Absolutely not. And I think that uh, it would be hypocritical of me to see it as a catastrophe uh, because, because of what it means to Jewish people when I'm at the same time asking Jewish people and Israelis in general to recognize my collective identity and my collective strive and my collective uh, uh, trauma and pain. And so I think that um, one of the most unique or inspiring things to me about my community, about the Arab community within Israel, is, is our duality. It's our strength. I mean, it's a curse sometimes because it makes things harder and more complicated. And sometimes it might, it might make us sound bipolar, but it's really a blessing at the end of the day because it gives us the ability to see, uh, to see both sides.
for sure. I love that. Um, we have some, it's time for audience Q and A. So I hope you're ready. Um, Shams, people want to hear from you. You are very popular. Um, folks really want to hear about your, um, experience with tomorrow's women. And they're curious, what is tomorrow's women? How did you get involved with that? And then also like, how did that translate into your, um, involvement in the pro-democracy movement? Um, and also how is that, what is that like as someone who's like Arab and female and, how does that land with you? How do you participate? Um, what a question. Well, I know about tomorrow's one when I was uh, 16 years old. Uh, I heard about it from school. Really, uh, I was really interested about uh, knowing more. So I just signed in. Um, and of course, my family really uh, supported me by signing and because it's only females, only girls, which is amazing because, you know, when we're only girls talking about what bothers us, we're like 16 girls, uh, eight Jewish and eight Arabs, four from the West Bank and four Palestinians from uh, 48, which is really uh which is an opportunity for me because I never had the chance to meet girls from the West Bank and Bank and hear their stories and also uh, see um, what all 16 girls have in common and uh, saying what's on our minds and everything we struggled in and everything we've been through is amazing because even though we fight, we, we fought and we talked about everything that on our on our minds, we eventually um, we eventually get got along. You know, we we uh, it was an amazing experience. I that's how I met. Eh, that's how I really got involved in Tomorrow's Woman. It opened a lot of doors for me. I participated in a tour with them this year, also in the U.S. Uh, you, eh, Rebecca said she she saw me there. <laughs> And it, it, it's it's a really um, it's really amazing. Awesome. Um, I'm also kind of curious. Um, like someone had asked about crime, and I'm a little curious about this too. About issue of violence against women. Um, I know that's huge in like Israeli society writ large, but like how does that impact like your community um, specifically? And that's to either of you. Um, if you have anything you want to note about it. So how do we feel about it or like, or like, can you talk more about it? And like, why is this like, you can talk a lot about like Arab violence writ large, but like the issue of violence against women specifically um, doesn't really um, get a whole ton of news. Um, I think that that's not only a problem here in Israel. I think it's also a problem all around the world, violence against women, not only here. But specifically yesterday, like I said, a 19 year old girl got shot, was killed for something really stupid. Um, it's really it's really awful because nobody does anything about it. They, especially in the Arab society, they just move along. They, that's what I know. They don't they don't really investigate. Even if 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 it's an Arab, they even if it's an Arab or an Arab one who shot her or killed her, you know, it's we're here, we, we live here, you know, we, we, we're from here. You should uh, investigate our, our crimes also. I think it's really, really bad what's happening, but, but I think it's a, it's a problem everywhere, not, not only here. Yeah, it's not particularly special on um, the issues that your community is facing. Patriarchy will, um, patriarchy. <laughs> I think I'd like to add on that. Um, uh, there are two things that we should keep in mind. I think that one of, um, I mean, this year we've seen, I think, uh, so far 15 women um, were killed, uh, were murdered. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, around 18% of them um, are from the Arab community. Um, and I think that the main reason for, uh, for their murder was, was their partner. Uh, you know, either their partners or, or um, um, uh, you know, members of, of, of their family. But I think that, you know, Loring, you mentioned uh, patriarchy. And I think, um, although it is um, more marginalized now, sort of that, that sense, you know, there's a lot of, there's a misconception talking about how, the, you know, the, the system and the state 
uh, views or problems. Uh, there's a lot of attempts to color all the murders of women in the Arab community as family honor. Uh, and I say it like this because uh, there's no honor uh, in, in, in murdering anyone. But in addition to that, it's a, it's a total misconception because the vast majority of women who've been killed in Israel in general were killed by either their children um, or mostly their partners, uh, not their brothers, not their fathers, not their uncles, uh, as uh, a lot of people seem to uh, want to think. Um, and I think that uh, that being said, I think uh, it still goes back to patriarchy and it still goes back to how cheap women lives are and how easy it is to, uh, to take a woman's life. Uh, whether it be because she doesn't want to do what you want her to do, or whether because it's you, it's, whether it's because you don't like her lifestyle, whether because uh, you know she wants to separate and you don't want her to separate. I come from a family where my parents got divorced, and I remember when my mom initiated the divorce. Uh, I remember the pressure that was put on her to be a good woman, a good wife, a good mom. Uh, you know, to put her needs aside and just go back to her home and take care of her children. Uh, like that's the only thing that women are supposed to do. So I think that, although again. Um, it is more of a systematic problem than it is a cultural problem. There are a lot of cultural aspects that we need to talk about. And it's, a, as you guys mentioned, it's a general thing that exists in all societies, especially in the Middle East, um, but in naturalistic societies in general and patriarchal societies. And these are things that we should be talking about and we need to, uh, to address uh, in order to, to, to fight this, uh, this, uh, this gender terrorism, as I call it. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's that's what I meant by patriarchy. Well, patriarchy, it's not family honor. It's the cheapness of. I wasn't talking about what you said. I just, you know, it's one of the things that I hear. I mean, again, our chief of police talks like that. This is our reality. This is this right. is what we as Arab citizens deal with. This right. kind of conversation, this kind of discourse, this kind of racism. It is systematic. It comes from the state. It comes from the state's institution, and therefore the state institutions, because they deeply don't understand uh, our needs and our culture um, and who we are, and they they sort of act on misconceptions, they fail over and over and over again. We're all just trying to find the guy who did this, truly. <laughs> um, okay, so I think that's all we have time for in Q&A. Um, thank you both so much for really being so thoughtful, um, engaging with us so much. Um, I really personally appreciate it. Um, I have huge admirers of you both. So thank you for hanging out with me for an hour. Um, we have a few announcements. Um, firstly, if you are curious about what Israel Policy Forum does, you are more than welcome to check our website out. It is israelpolicyforum.org. And I think one of us, if we have the ability to drop that link in the announcements or the Q&A, we'll happily do that for you. So you go take a looky-loo at what we have to offer. There's a bunch of really cool resources um, that get updated all the time. I think 50 Steps Before the Deal, just the 50 Steps basic policy recommendations that we need to take before, you know, a two-state solution can really come to fruition is uh, one of the one of them. Um, and I really highly recommend checking that one out. That's one of my favorites. Um, so I'm just going to tell you all to look at that one first. Um, secondly, we are actively recruiting for the 2023 cohort for the IPF Atid Charles Bronfman Conveners Program. Um, it's a really awesome program. Uh, for like lay leaders, and you don't need to be a, you know a Jewish pr professional um, to in apply for this one. They take all sorts of folks, um, but you learn a lot about the conflict, and you get to talk to some really interesting folks, um, and then bring that knowledge back to your your communities. And as the non chapter city chair, I want if you do not live in the obvious coastal cities or the obvious cities where you think folks live, um, I want to encourage you to apply. That's just my bias as the non chapter city chair. And then finally, I want to invite you all to uh, join us for the final event for, uh, for this particular series, Voices from the Grassroots. Um, it's going to be in the spirit of Shavuot. We have that night of learning. Um, please join us for the concluding event. Um, we're going to be hosting several breakouts, highlighting the work of Atidniks, like all of us here. Um, the, how the work we're doing to promote democracy in Israel and some of the biggest challenges facing Israel, Zionism, and global Jewry. Um, you can come and go as you please, so you can just bounce between the breakout rooms. I think I'm actually moderating one of those sessions, so if you didn't hate me moderating now, you should probably go check that out, and we'll have a great conversation. It's going to be a great time. Um, so with that, I think I'm done, unless Max or anyone else has anything to add from IPF. Again, thank you so much for joining us. This was a great conversation. Um, yeah. And if you too have any social media things that you want to plug, also feel free to put that in the Q&A so people can follow the incredible work that you both are doing. 
um yeah thank you have a lovely rest of the day <laughs> thank you very much take care yeah thanks Thank <laughs> you.